Okay, great. Thank you for coming back from the coffee break on time. Thank you to Paula for sitting in the front row and laughing and smiling at all my jokes in advance. Um, so I'm going to be talking about why distributed systems are so hard. Um, that's my Twitter handle. That's my website. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, DevOps Days. This is my first time at DevOps Days. This is my first time speaking at DevOps Days, so I'm super pumped to be here. Um, I work as a software engineer at Pivotal Cloud Foundry. I also was accidentally a product manager for six months, so if you want to chat about, I don't know, like Wardley Maps or whatever, you can come find me later. Um, I, now most of you know from my unconference session yesterday, um, I like to use Sketchnote, so you can see my entire collection there if you want. Everything I do is Creative Commons licensed, so you may freely use them um, at your workplace in your own conference presentations. I'm very, very happy for my work to be shared uh, with attribution, of course. Um, and finally, I uh, spent a lot of time thinking about how to get more people into public speaking. I spent a lot of time thinking about how to make this industry more inclusive and more empathetic. So if you like talking about these topics, do come talk to me later. I am very passionate about all of these. So as I mentioned briefly, um, this is a very visual heavy deck. Uh, the last few times I've run this, I mostly, this is the face that I see from audience members. Um, so what I want to say is like all the slides are going to be available freely, downloadable, freely re uh, reusable on my website later. So um, if you are someone who's worried about capturing all the detail, don't worry about that now. Um, do sit back and enjoy the slides. Uh, I will give you everything later. So no talk is complete without a bit of shameless self-promotion. So I'm writing a book right now. It's a children's A to Z of continuous delivery. <laughs> I'm uh, co-writing this with my friend Steve Smith. Um, so do check us out on LeanPub. It's not complete yet. We have a couple of letters. We're still working on it. But do consider buying this for any nieces, nephews, children you have who may be writing enterprise software. <laughs> so I also spend a lot of time doodling gophers and things like this. is just like more self-promotion. <laughs> Um, cool, so this is a quick rundown of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to talk about why distributed databases are even a thing. Um, we're going to have a recap. If you don't know that joke yet, don't worry, you'll get it at the end. Uh, we're going to take a deeper dive into network partitions, and I'm going to do a very, very quick high-level hand-wavy overview of how other people who are smarter than me handle net partitions in the open source community. So, story time. Um, quick history lesson. A long time ago, in a data center far, far away, all business applications tended to talk to one monolithic database. And that database tended to be hosted on that company's own hardware. And it was probably in the basement and probably one person knew how to operate it. Definitely doesn't happen anymore, right? Definitely the past. So architectures look kind of like this. So you had multiple client applications. They would talk directly to the monolithic database. Um, and of course, we perform big bang schema migrations on weekends because that's how we mitigate risk. Um, so. Sorry, sarcasm. Uh, <laughs> so of course today, that architecture that you just saw is no longer sufficient for most use cases. Today, data storage and retrieval needs have become a lot more complicated. Why? One reason is because business analysis is a lot more data-driven than it used to be. So you have people whose job title is perhaps business analyst, perhaps product owner, perhaps product manager. Who even knows? I don't know like, what these words mean anymore. But what they want to do at the end of the day is they want to run really expensive SQL queries on data warehouses. So you can't have that monolithic app anymore because that means downtime for any applications who are trying to read and write data. We also, have, we also live in a beautiful age where everything is machine learned and artificially uh, has artificial intelligence, um, which means that we have different requirements for how we interact with the data. So things like fuzzy, uh, naive string matching, um, in some cases, doesn't cut it anymore. So you introduce more complicated things like fuzzy searching, um, like uh, natural language processing. Um, and another reason is because we just have more data than we ever had before in human history. And we also want to interact with that data faster. So we've introduced things like Redis, like Memcache, things that optimize query speed. Um, with uh, perhaps key value storage. Um, there are lots more reasons beyond these, but I was just hoping to give a broad overview of why data retrieval and storage is more complicated today than it was even 10 or 20 years ago. So what do we do? To meet these evolving needs, um, the first thing we did was we scaled vertically, which means to bolt more compute power onto the machines that we already had. But the problem was that at some point, it was no longer financially sensible or perhaps physically possible to add that last 1% of CPU or that last 1% of memory. 
Fortunately for people who have huge amounts of data to store and retrieve, cloud computing came onto the scene um, maybe in the last 20, I don't actually know, like last 20 years or so, something like that. So of course you have your public clouds like AWS, which Kate gave a fantastic talk about yesterday. Um, you have GCP, you have Azure, and of course you have private clouds. Um, vSphere is one example of one a VMware product. So what this means is that because we have cloud computing, we have an easier mechanism than ever before to get extra machines on demand as you need it without ticketing or hopefully without ticketing or anything like that, which, may, which makes it easier to distribute one workload over multiple machines. So this is called horizontal, horizontal scaling or horizontal distribution of a workload. Why might you want to leverage cloud computing technology to horizontally distribute your workloads? One reason is scalability, which means that um, when you hit those physical limits or those unit economics reasons to stop going uh, vertically, sometimes one machine can't handle the volume of data you want to store, or perhaps it can't handle the volume of the request. So one way to do this is to take one data set distributed over multiple machines, which is called fragmentation or sharding. I'll cover it a little bit later on, slightly more detail. Another reason is availability. So when you have multiple machines operating, it means you can replicate your data. So you can have multiple copies of the same data stored in multiple data centers, which means if EU West 1B goes down, not all is lost. And finally, latency. So data that can be stored physically closer to where your end users are making requests from means that you'll have better request times. So there are more reasons than these three, um, but these are what I think are the most important three to highlight. So I wanna talk for a minute about modern distributed systems. You may have heard the term shared nothing architecture before. Um, this is the most popular form of network computing today, and this is how all the public clouds are designed, as far as I'm aware. It means that um, machines don't share access to any physical resources. So one machine CPU can only be accessed by that machine, not shared. This leads to a number of fun complications that I'll discuss shortly. But let's zoom out a little bit more. I don't have like the cool map zooming in and out slides on mine. Um, what does it mean to run a distributed system in the year 2018? Given that we're working with a shared nothing architecture, according to Martin Kletman, who wrote a fantastic book that I highly recommend you read, uh, Designing Data Intensive Applications, it means that there are lots and lots of processes running on lots of different machines, and you only have message passing via an unreliable network with variable delays, and the system may suffer from partial failures, unreliable clocks, and process pauses. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So distributed computing is notoriously difficult. Some, some really smart people at Sun Microsystems in the late 90s came up with a list of, originally seven, and then it became eight later, eight common fallacies of distributed computing. This is a sketch note I did a few weeks ago. I'm not gonna talk through this whole sketch note now. I will give this to you later, but I want you to focus on this one. The network is unreliable. This is the most important one, and this is what most of this talk will be about today. So some of you might be sitting in your chairs right now, getting ready to flip tables and think, well, there's so much unreliability in distributed systems. Why would anybody ever get themselves into this mess? Um, so when all we have really is what educated guesses about what's going on in our systems. By the way, this cat is panicking while eating popcorn. So if you get the Unix joke, I'll give you a high five later. <laughs> so really, this is an epistemology problem. <laughs> this is no longer a technical problem. Epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge. It asks the question, how can we really be sure we know the things that we think we know? So the next sentence is one I was super excited to say at a tech conference. Fortunately for everyone at DevOps days, I studied philosophy in college. <laughs> so within epistemic philosophy, we have two main schools. We have foundationalism, which holds that there are fundamental truths about the universe upon all other knowledge is built kind of like how there are mathematical first principles. And then you have coherentism, which means that nothing is absolutely true on its own, just like a matchstick won't stand on its own. But when you have enough other supporting truths that interlock and reinforce each other logically, that's how you know that stuff is probably true. So in distributed systems reasoning, whichever epistemological school you subscribe to, it's a really hard task to start to even define your foundational truths or to identify your interlocking truths of the world. And of course, what if we're all just brains and bats and nothing is real, right? <laughs> I like to argue in the pub sometimes that I think the skeptics were the world's first internet trolls before the internet. 
And on top of that, I'll give you a second to read this slide. On top of that, unreliable message passing is totally a thing. The classic case is the Byzantine generals problem. Sometimes it's called the two generals problem. So imagine you have two generals who are trying to coordinate a war, they're trying to like wage war. They can't talk to each other directly though, so they have to rely on this message passer, this message sender, um, who is an unreliable numpty. And the generals can't know in the end whether the message relayed was actually from his fellow war maker general, or if it was corrupted, if it was intercepted, or maybe it was just some, something made up by the messenger. This kind of problem happens all the time in distributed systems. So of course, we have some tools. We have like mutual TLS, for example, that can mitigate some of these harms. But at the end of the day, we always have to be thinking about things like spoofing and things like tampering. And sometimes messages just straight up get corrupted mid-flight because your load balancer truncates your, I don't know, TCP packets or something. Never happened to me, definitely. Um, <laughs> So of course, we can mitigate a lot of these problems by monitoring and observing our systems. This is a huge topic. I'm not gonna talk a lot in depth about this today. So there are lots and lots of things we are just never gonna be able to know about distributed systems. But we can be certain of one thing. Shit's gonna fail. <laughs> so, which brings us to the next chapter of this talk, the CAP theorem. So, I like, wasn't sure if I was gonna do this next joke, but I'm gonna do it. So I've been trying to do this thing on Twitter where I try to talk about thought leadership and software development as if it was hip hop records being produced. And so far, only two people have retweeted me. So I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> In the year 2000, Dr. Eric Brewer dropped the cap theorem at the Principles of Computing Conference. I always am like the person who laughs the hardest at that joke. Awkward. <laughs> All right, so what does CAP stand for? CAP stands for consistent, uh, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Um, this is a framework to think about how distributed systems are designed. And on the internet, people like to represent it this way. You have C, A, and P, and you can choose two, which means that you can, of all of these three, you can discard one. But that's wrong. That's not possible. You cannot design a distributed system this way and I don't care what marketers say, you can't do this. If you're really married to the CAP theorem as an analytical tool, at least you should think about it like this. It's because you cannot sacrifice partition tolerance um, for reasons that I will go into more depth on. Um, even when you're running all of your workloads in one data center though, nothing is ever going to be immune to network partitions. Literally the only way you could 100% prevent a network partition is to run a single node system, at which point it's not distributed. So let's go a little bit deeper into each letter. C is for linearizability. <laughs> it's funny because it doesn't begin with C. So the C in cap means a really narrow definition of strong consistency. It means that if you have two operations that update the same register at two different points in time, any client that has seen the data at T2 means that all other clients from that point forward must see T2. The system cannot return T1 if anyone has seen the data at T2. This is really, really hard. This is a super strong sense of the word consistency. It basically demands instant and universal replication, which is impossible because you're always gonna be lower bounded by the speed of light, like physics, but data, database engineers do spend a lot of time trying to reduce that replication lag to zero, as close as possible to zero. Um, also, no one actually does full linearizability. Mostly you just do it for, uh, on writes rather than for reads. And the other, the final two comments I'll make here are eventual consistency doesn't count. Um, it doesn't count as part of the cap theorem formulation. So this means if you have asynchronous replication and your nodes will eventually have the updated state, that doesn't, that violates the definition of linearizability. And this is known as um, strong consistency, a phrase that I've been using already. Um, strong consistency creates more resource demands on your system and it's more prone to blocking because it has this synchronous requirement. 
So there are lots and lots of different ways to define consistency. This is a snapshot from Kyle Kingsbury's blog, um, a fantastic resource also if you want to learn more about distributed computing. The takeaway here is that in this tree, you can see that different definitions logically imply other things about the world. And there are many, many different degrees of consistency. I kind of want to say it's a spectrum, but it's not. It's just like discrete states among, I guess, uh, on different degrees. I think the key thing is that we just have to be really, really careful about what we mean when we say that a system is consistent or this was designed with consistency in mind. So, next letter. A is for availability. So we tend to think of availability as being a binary state, but the reality is a lot messier because of network latency, and network latency also was not part of the CAP theorem's original formulation. So how can we know if a node is truly unresponsive, right, or if it's just being slow? So because network latency wasn't part of the CAP theorem, it's something that's often overlooked, but I think it's really important because it has some really big impacts on how we think about detecting and responding to partition events. So one way to deal with things being slow is to set up a timeout. Determining what constitutes a reasonable timeout is a very scientific process. <laughs> but seriously, the first time you set up a new system, you might as well roll some dice. You need monitoring and observability to learn what constitutes a normal baseline for your system and only react to, uh, only call it a partition, for example, if that normal baseline is violated. There are also some databases like Cassandra that have fuzzy timeout boundaries built into them, um, but of course this is not 100% fool, uh, foolproof. So the final thing is P, which is for partition tolerance. So a partition refers to a network partition, which is also sometimes called a network fault or a network split, they're all the same thing. Um, this occurs when you have connectivity between two nodes and that connectivity gets interrupted. So the two nodes can run in the same data center, they can run in different data centers, they can run in different clouds, whatever you want. Network partitions are just one failure of, are just one genre of failure scenarios in distributed systems. Um, they're not like the be all, end all. There's other fun things that can also go wrong. During a partition event, your nodes might as well be on opposite sides of a wormhole. There's no way to know the state of the other side. So you don't know if the other side is operational, you don't know if it's continuing to respond to client requests or health checks. Um, you just have no visibility whatsoever. So I'm gonna quickly go through the proof of the CAP theorem. Um, the proof of the CAP theorem is quite straightforward. A partition event, imagine a partition event happens, you have some nodes on that side, you have some nodes on this side, and connectivity gets interrupted. So you now have two options for how to, how to deal. Like you can respond in one of two ways. The first way is that you let clients on both sides of the partition continue to read and write data, which results in the loss of linearizability because that same register might be updated on this side. Any clients who are connected on that side, by definition, won't be able to see the updated state. Or you can pause writes on one side of the partition until the partition stops, which will sacrifice availability. So let's zoom in more on partition tolerance. Um, before we dive in, let's do some quick disambiguation because like everything in, I originally wrote like everything in DISSYS, but really like everything in tech, we can't seem to agree on language for anything. So a partition is not uh, this kind of partition. So this is not what I'm talking about. Sometimes the word partition is used to describe the same concept as sharding or fragmentation, which means when you have a huge data set and you can't fit it all in one machine, so you divide it up over multiple machines based on some kind of index. Encyclopedias are a really good IRL example of sharding. You can't publish a book with a spine long enough to hold every single letter in the alphabet. The second thing to call out, and slightly more controversial, is that failed nodes are not the same thing as partition events. We can have a debate about whether failure is truly black or white, um, but I think most people would agree that for a node to be considered failed, it has to be totally unresponsive in a verifiable way. That means, for example, it's failing a health check for sure with an expected 500 something response. Because total failure states actually give you more certainty, not less certainty, into the state of your system, I will argue that this is not a partial failure scenario in the same way that partition events are. So I wanna talk for a bit on why network partitions are inevitable and just how inevitable they are. So I'm gonna pick on a small company 
in the first year of a Google cluster's life, it will experience five rack failures, three router failures, and eight network maintenances. And this comes from Jeff Dean, who still works on this stuff. This is probably still true. I think he wrote this a few years ago. Why is that the case? Why do things just fail all the time? The first reason is hardware. So your hardware is just going to give out eventually. You can't design anything to be totally foolproof. For example, the hardware holding together your routers will fail at some point. Your network cables will eventually give out. And perhaps, apparently, sometimes sharks mistake undersea cables for fish and decide to chew on them. Although, Ars Technica wants you to know that as of 2015, it's official, sharks are no longer a threat to subsea internet cables <laughs> because Google wraps them in Kevlar. <laughs> Truth. And as anyone who has ever written software will know, sometimes you write some code and you ship it and it's like your baby and then it does the complete opposite of what you want it to do. So software will do unexpected things. Um, in multi-tenant servers, which is the case for most public cloud providers, if not all, resource isolation is never actually gonna be perfect and static. Um, and for reasons that are out of scope for now, you actually don't want resource isolation to be totally static. VMs will do what we call bursting, which means that they'll briefly spike in CPU usage, for example, and if your database node it happens to be running on that same machine, um, you could see your process get slowed down or get suspended for a few seconds or maybe minutes. Another reason is there are some languages out there, like Golang, which uh, implement stop the world garbage collection. This causes everything to suspend as for as long as it takes for the, um, the whatever to like collect all the, sorry, that was a really bad sentence. This, will, this can take minutes or seconds depending on your machine. And it can make it look like a node is disconnected when this is happening. And finally, network glitches are just randomly going to happen. So this is Glitch from Wreck-It Ralph. Go see the movie if this slide doesn't make sense to you. And also sometimes people glitch, right? Or like people just do bad things sometimes. So in April of 2009, a person crawled into a manhole with an ax and decided to chop all the fiber optic cables serving San Jose. So a lot of people in Southern California were disconnected for a little while. So bad things are gonna happen. Hopefully, I've established that by now. But fortunately, it's 2018, and Game of Thrones is not back yet, so this is my <laughs> way of, I don't know, I guess like communicating ambiently to George R. R. Martin. What do we say to the god of total catastrophic downtime? Not today. So remember, we've horizontally scaled now. We have a couple copies of our data in a, in a couple different places, perhaps. Um, one way for that data to be written and replicated is the leader-follower pattern. And a quick note I want to make here, there is some recent controversy on Twitter, which is my source of news, 100%, about the, the term master-slave um, being used for this kind of description. This is a legacy term, and I just want to make a note here that I think as technologists, we have a responsibility to A, be better humans, and B, choose names that are good. Um, and one of the simplest ways we can do that is not to use harmful and misleading language. So if you take nothing else away from today, um, perhaps try to listen and gently correct when you hear the term master-slave in the future and suggest alternatives like leader-follower, primary replica. There's lots of alternatives that are more descriptive. Anyway, so if the leader fails, then a new leader needs to be designated. So this process is called failover. Um, I made this sketch note a few weeks back about how new leader failover generally works. Um, a lot of hand-waving here, but I want you to focus on three things. There needs to be three things that happen. First, we need to detect that something went wrong. Secondly, figure out who the new leader is going to be. And third, reconfigure the world to understand who the new leader is. So when a cluster gets split into multiple pieces, there's no way of knowing whether the other side will come back or when that will happen. The risk of electing a new leader during a partition event, if your leader gets split away, is that you end up with multiple leaders you could end up with one leader on each side of the split. So what if the other side manages to rejoin the cluster at the end of the partition event? Then things get really awkward and data will usually get lost for most, um, in most databases. This scenario, by the way, is called split brain and there are lots of different strategies to recover from this, which I'm not gonna talk about today. So I wanna close by quickly discussing how do other people deal with network partitions. So we'll take a quick look at RabbitMQ under partition, and we'll take a look at Kafka under partition. So RabbitMQ is written in Erlang, which is a great language if you wanna write distributed systems. Um, all RabbitMQ nodes are 
amnesia nodes. Amnesia is RabbitMQ's built-in distributed database. RabbitMQ can run in leader follower, but by default it doesn't. So RabbitMQ will detect that it's in a partition if there are nodes within the cluster that haven't been communicated with for 60 seconds. Manisha will then flag those nodes as being unreachable and say like, well, I think we're in a partition state right now. So when some nodes become unavailable, RabbitMQ has a number of coping strategies that you have to set up before the partition event. Um, uh, this is to allow operators to choose whether they care more about data consistency or availability. So I'll quickly go over two of them. In pause minority mode, one part of the cluster will suspend. The side with fewer nodes will just go to sleep and stop processing messages. In this mode, RabbitMQ chooses consistency because there's no risk of the data diverging on either side of the split. In auto heal mode, both sides will continue to process messages. In this mode, we choose availability. The, pro the problem is when the partition ends and nodes rejoin, the ones on the losing side of the split will just have their data dropped. They copy the world of the side that had more clients connected when the partition happened. So let's finish by talking about Kafka. I'm gonna left. So Kafka works a little bit different from RabbitMQ. Um, Kafka doesn't really use a 60 second timeout. Kafka nodes are always, Kafka nodes are called brokers. They're always streaming to each other, kind of like in a group WhatsApp or whatever. So when someone has dropped off, they know. If the leader drops off, then a, an election gets triggered. Of all the people who are, all the people, of all the nodes who are electable to the new leadership position, um, they have to choose from a set called in sync replicas. A majority of nodes vote for a leader from this set. Knowledge about which nodes are ISRs is persisted by a tool called Apache Zookeeper, which is a separate thing that runs alongside the cluster, which by the way is called the thick API pattern because it holds a lot of metadata about the world, but Zookeeper doesn't actually process data on its own. Um, there are trade-offs to using this pattern. When nodes come back online, in order to be considered candidates to join the ISR set, they might have to drop unflushed data, like me going to Gatwick Airport, trying to check in for my Ryanair flight. So the science of getting things to agree generally is called consensus algorithms. You may have heard of other things like Paxos, Raft, all really interesting stuff. Definitely no time to explain those in more depth today, but do go and learn, and when you do learn about them, come teach me how they work. So let's bring it all home now. Network partitions are unavailable, or sorry, <laughs> unavailable. Network partitions are unavoidable if you wanna run distributed systems. You have to decide what makes the most sense operationally for you. Um, you have to choose a data store that offers configuration options, that offers uh, consistency guarantees, maybe availability guarantees that you're comfortable with. Um, and don't run a distributed system until you really, really have to. So here are my slides. Um, again, I'll send this out on Twitter afterwards. Bibliography is there as well. Find my book. Thank you.